All right, the title of the sermon this morning is Why We Must Preach the Gospel. Why We Must Preach the Gospel. I'm going to give you a few reasons this morning why we must preach the gospel. Now, the Great Commission, which is what we read there in Matthew 28, is found in all four gospels. And we'll show you here. So we, we saw the one in Matthew. John 20, 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So this is how we have people's sins remitted. We preach unto them the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 24, 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then we saw that in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now the Great Commission has three parts to it, right? Go and preach the gospel, right? Baptizing believers, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So the, the Great Commission is not just preaching the gospel, right? Even though that's what I'm talking about today. Going out and preaching the gospel to unbelievers is the first part of the Great Commission. But we need to be involved in all parts of the Great Commission, right? Preaching the gospel, you know, trying to get people baptized, and then also involved in teaching the Bible, right? So in different ways we can all teach the Bible. It's not only from the pulpit that the Bible gets taught, right? It gets taught in other areas as well. I mean, it's taught in kids' club. It's taught as you talk amongst each other. You know, different people have different ways to teach the Bible and to share things that they've learned from the Bible to build each other up. Now, these were the last words spoken by Jesus before the ascension, right? This is meant to be the, the, the mission that underlies every mission statement of every church. But unfortunately, in some churches, it, it's not the great uh, commission. They say it's the great omission. It's the one thing that doesn't get done, right? So it needs to be the basis of every church's mission statement. And it is the basis of our church's mission as well. So you don't want the Great Commission to be the great omission in church, but you don't want the Great Commission to be the great omission in your life as well as an individual Christian, right? So we must preach the gospel. Now the first reason we must preach the gospel is because it is commanded of us. Preaching the gospel is not an optional ministry, right? It is the responsibility of every believer. It's not just the responsibility of church leaders or those that are in the ministry full-time or work for a church full-time. It is the responsibility of every believer, right? Now, different people can do it to different capacities, but everybody must be involved in the Great Commission and must be involved in preaching the gospel. You know why? Because there are people in this world that only you will have an opportunity to share the gospel with that only you will have an opportunity to persuade, that maybe you will be the person that they will listen to. And if you are not ready to preach the gospel, if you do not take that responsibility up on yourself, then that opportunity may be lost to persuade them. Now, I'm not saying that it's necessarily your fault that they go to hell, right? If they don't believe on Jesus Christ, I don't believe that, right? Because I think I believe it's the person's responsibility to believe on Jesus Christ, but what we can do as Christians, as ambassadors, as soldiers for Jesus Christ, is that we have an opportunity to change people's mind, right? You may be able to persuade them to not stay in their unbelief and, you know, like get the consequences of their unbelief, which is to end up in hell for all eternity. So it is a command. It's not just for the disciples at the time. Because some people will say, oh yeah, but the Great Commission, that was given to just the disciples at the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's for everyone, 
right? You know, some people in the church do it, some people don't. You know, that's not enough. You know, the Great Commission in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to take everybody needs to be involved in it. Well, I would beg to differ. You know, I do believe it applies to us, and I can think we can come at it from a different angle, right? Why don't we look at Paul's example, right? If you were to say, well, what is Paul's, what, what was Paul known for? I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are our ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. So this is what it means to be an ambassador. You're speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ, and this is why we have to behave like ambassadors of Jesus Christ, because you want to be a good example and a good picture of Jesus Christ here. Because as though God did beseech you by us. See, that's what we're doing when we're going out and preaching the gospel, is that we are beseeching people to believe on Jesus Christ on God's behalf. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. You see how Paul understood that it wasn't optional. He understood that it, it was a commandment, a necessity was given unto him. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is he saying there? He said, if we do this willingly, then we can be rewarded for it. But if you don't, you're commanded to do it anyway. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain them all. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. So this shows to the extent that um, Paul took this task seriously, that he tried to relate to different people. That I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So he's saying, I'm trying to relate to them, but I'm not giving up my principles and my morals. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You know, some people say it's not right to say, I got this person saved, or I helped this person get saved. Well, Paul didn't have a problem with it. Right, so we understand that you know, we, don't, we didn't die for them, right? But if you throw somebody the, the, the life jacket or you throw somebody the, the lifeline that they grab onto, I mean, yeah, that thing saved them, but you're the one that helped them get to it, right? So it's, it's a partnership between Jesus Christ and the body of believers that we go out and preach the gospel and beseech them on behalf of God. Um, that's why we have a part to play. It's like... It's like father and mother, right? Well, who, who gave more birth to the child? Well, it required both. It's the same with the gospel. Who saved them? Well, Jesus Christ obviously saves them and provides the grace, but when we tell them about it, we can also say, well, that we saved people by telling them about it. We persuaded them, right? So same with Paul here. That's why there's nothing wrong with saying, I saved somebody. You know, but you're not, of course, what you mean by it is not you died on the cross for them. You're saying that you persuaded them. You may, have, you may have put the effort in to convince them to believe on Jesus Christ, the one who did die for them. And this is what Paul is saying here. That I might by all means save some. He's not saying he's their saviour. Right? And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So you say, well, that's just saying that Paul is, you know, meant to go out and preach the gospel. Yeah, that's him. He was a full-time minister. You know, he was an apostle. Yeah, that's why he's doing his, the ministry of reconciliation was given to him. Woe unto him if he doesn't preach the gospel. Somebody's trying to connect their uh, AirPods, but it's connecting to my iPad for some reason. So whoever's doing that, I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> First Corinthians 4. Look what Paul says here. Now, you shouldn't be playing with your AirPods in church. I don't know who's that. Well, unless it's, automa it's automatically connecting, that's all right. All right, wherefore, look at what Paul says here. Wherefore I beseech you, look at this, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways. What was his ways? 
was Paul's ways. Paul's ways was he was an evangelist. Which be in Christ as I teach everywhere and in every church. Now, obviously, it's not all that Paul was. But obviously, if Paul took it on himself to go, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel, necessity is laid upon me. And he's saying, hey, be followers of me. Well, that shows that the great commission that Paul was fulfilling is for us too. 1 Thessalonians 1. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. So he's praising the Thessalonians here for following his example, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. So do you think the Thessalonians faith was known in every place abroad just by expecting people to come to them you know just just like the people that come across their life as they go about their business that's how their faith was known in every place and even in other places of course not right because what was happening in Thessalon Thessalonica is that they were going about preaching the gospel that's how places knew them Right, Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. So Paul wants us to follow him and he's saying, hey, we'll also follow you know, those that are following our example. Right? So he's not just saying just follow Paul, but also those that are following his example, follow them. Philippians 4.9 Philippians 4, 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Right. I, always, I always love these words from Paul because it shows that you know, he had the example where he could say to people, not just do as I say. He's saying, look, you, what the things you've learned from me, so he taught them, first of all, and received from him, so personally received from him, and heard and seen in me do. See, so he's saying, follow my example. And would to God that all Christians can say that. And the God of peace shall be with you. 1 Corinthians 11, be, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. So that's Paul's example. Look at Jesus here. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So you see how Jesus, when he introduced himself to these disciples here, he said, Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And Paul says, Follow him as he follows Christ. So what was Christ making Paul? A fisher of men. And if you're meant to follow Paul, what should you be? A fisher of men. Right? So it's commanded that we preach the gospel. Now, preaching the gospel is not only for the men. Right? It's for the women too. You know, sometimes in churches, women think, oh, you know, my husband, or, you know, they're, they're involved in church. That's enough for my family. Right? No. The women need to be involved in the Great Commission just like the men do as well. And it's different in different churches. I like to make this point because I've seen this in churches before. I've seen it in our church too. Acts 2.17. This is the day of Pentecost, right? When the disciples went out preaching the gospel. Look at what it says here. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Look at this. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy right they're preaching the word of god here and it shows here that when god poured out his spirit on the day of pentecost he didn't just pour out his spirit on the men he poured out his spirit on the women as well because he wants women to be spirit filled preachers of the gospel too and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens right see there's the ladies there i will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. I mean, same with Paul. You think Paul was out and about preaching the gospel, but he wasn't on his own. 
Look at Philippians 4, 3, and I treat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me. Look at this, in the gospel. So it wasn't help those women which labored with me in the, in the hospitality, labored with me in the kitchen, labored with me in the cleaning. You know, maybe they did that stuff too. But that's not a replacement for the Great Commission. So he said, he said help those women, look, which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are written in the book of life. So, like I said, it's not a good, good enough for ladies to say, oh, my father goes soul winning for our family. You know, my husband goes soul winning for our family. Or my husband does this for us. My husband does enough service for me. No, right? We need to all be involved in the Great Commission. And same with men. You know, men, you have to make sure your wife has an opportunity to go soul winning. That's why you see, like me and Elizabeth, we take turns, right? So like, sometimes I look after the kids because I want her to have the opportunity also to go out and preach the gospel and be part of the door knocking in our church. So you are in sin if you are not participating in the Great Commission. I'm not saying there's only one way to do it, but you need to be participating in the Great Commission. And sometimes people say, well, can't I just talk about Jesus with the people I meet? And I sort of alluded to this while I was talking about the church in Thessalonica. People say like, hey, well, you know, isn't it enough just for me to just talk to people as I, as I go about my life and just when people ask me about it and then I tell them about it? But let me ask you, I mean, don't you, don't you think, I mean, judging from what we've read already, you know, with the Great Commission and things like that, I mean, what do you think is the heart of God? Do you think the heart of God is that you just share the gospel when it's convenient for you as you go about the things you want to do and when it's convenient, then you share the gospel? If they bring it up, you know, those sort of things? Or do you think that God would expect us from what we read in the Bible that there's a bit of proactiveness from the church of God to reach people that would, we would otherwise not come across? I mean, there, there are people in this area that we will not come across, this circle of people. Right, so what are we doing to reach those people that we would not otherwise come across? Well, that's what the evangelism ministry and church is for. But the, the idea of the door knocking is let's go and talk to people that we would otherwise never meet, right? Because I'm not saying it's not one or the other. It's not well, I, I talk to people in my life and therefore I don't need to go door knocking. Or I go door knocking, then I don't talk to people in my life. You've got to do both. Right? Because you want to meet, you want to talk to your circle of influence. But as a church, we need to reach those outside our circle of influence too. Otherwise, who's going to do it? Right? If the Christians don't do it, if the Christians that know the truth and believe the truth don't do it, who do you expect to do it? So we have to do it. Right? There's really not that many ways to meet strangers. Right? Now, if you go. Uh, in your own time and go to a public area or go to the shops or whatever, you go out of your way to go meet somebody that you would not otherwise meet and preach the gospel, hey, that's fine. That, that's, the, that's the same thing. But look, we're, here, we're all human, right? And we all have sheep tendencies. You know, it's very rare that people will just take it on themselves to go and preach the gospel in their own time, take time out of their day and, and go do it. If they do, hey, good on them. Right? I don't even think I have that. So that's why I like having scheduled times. We can go with other people because that motivates and encourages me to go along with others. So why do we have the Sunday afternoon soul winning? It's to encourage you so that you can just come along and go with others that are going as well. That's the idea. It's not saying that that's the only way to do it. But really, there are not that many ways to meet strangers. Like, like you either go knock on their door or you go meet them in a public place. So that's why it's there. We have a scheduled time to go soul winning to encourage you to do it when you may not normally do it yourself. All right, That's the first reason we must preach the gospel. Second reason we must preach the gospel is because hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. You know, and you, you think about this, and we, we probably don't think about it as often as we should, that hell is a real place, and that ought to compel us to want people to know about how to be saved. Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen <coughs> and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores 
and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see Abraham <coughs> afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. <coughs> then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So that tells us, you know, the Bible is enough to convince people to believe on Jesus Christ. And even if somebody comes back from the dead, they don't believe the Bible. They won't believe that either. And the funny thing is that Jesus did come back from the dead. People still don't believe that. But, you know, this, this, this story, it's not a parable, because, you know, people, a lot of people try and explain this way that it's a parable, but you know, par it can't be a parable because it's using hell to, in this parable, so hell has to be a real thing. So hell is real. You know, it's not a parable. You know, why does the beggar have a name? You know, Abraham is a real person. This is, not, this is not a parable. This is a story that is being told to warn people about what happens if you die without a saviour. And it's a story being told to give us insight into what people in hell are thinking, right? And they're not thinking it's a great place down there. They are suffering in hell, right? They're realising that they're wrong and they don't want others to go there, right? So we can fulfill the wishes of this rich man in hell by going and telling people about Jesus Christ so they don't go to this place of torment. Right? So hell is a real place. Right? Now anyone who dies right, and goes to, and d dies without Jesus Christ, like that's where they're going to go. Right? They will immediately be in hell. We, that's what we're seeing from this story. Because right? it's not this purgatory where there's a second chance that the Orthodox and the Catholics believe. Right? So you see here, here. So the rich man also died and was buried. You can see here that this is a semicolon. So the thought's not finished. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. So you see, when people die without a saviour, they immediately are in hell, right? Awaiting. The, the final judgment where they're cast into the lake of fire, right? But there is no second chances. This is another thing that this story tells us, that when a person dies, it's not like they're able to negotiate with God whether or not they get into heaven. They die, and they open their eyes, and they're in hell, right? But what happens to the saved person? They, they die, they open their eyes, and Jesus says they'll never die because they, they go on to live in heaven, right, prior to the resurrection. Revelation 20. And I saw a great throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Right? We go down to verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So if you know the end times events, you know, there's going to be this thousand year reign. So anyone that dies now and is in hell, they will, will, will be in hell for a minimum of a thousand years, right? Because if you die right before a thousand years and you're not saved, 
it's going to be a thousand years until this event where you come out of hell, right, for a brief moment. Now, a thousand years is a pretty long time, you know, and that's nothing in comparison to eternity. But in that context, this is why when you wonder, when you read Philippians 2, and, and the Bible says here in Philippians 2, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is about every name, look at this, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You think to yourself, well, how can, how can that happen when there are like staunch atheists, people that hate Jesus Christ? Do you know why? Because even the most staunch atheists, the staunch hater of Jesus Christ, when they get to hell, they're going to be gritting their teeth, thinking, oh, I don't believe that God did this to me. Ah. But you know, as the days go on, and the months go on, they realize the torment doesn't stop. They're going to start thinking, what are they going to start thinking about? Ah, all the times that somebody tried to preach them the gospel, and they just did not believe on that. And then, you know, they think, oh man, they just... Month after month, year after year, they're thinking, I should have just believed on Jesus Christ. How foolish was I? And then they, don't, they probably don't know the timeline, right? And a thousand years are up, all of a sudden, the torment stops. They come out of hell. And it's the great white throne judgment. And who do they see sitting on the throne? Jesus Christ. What do you think the first thing out of their mouth is going to be? Jesus, you are Lord. You know, forgive me, save me. This is why every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, we'll be doing it as well, right? But they'll be doing it pleading for their life. You know, you remember how God says he's going to mock when their fear comes because they mocked Jesus Christ. Well, they mocked him, right? So you wonder, how can every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Every knee will bow because there will be a moment when everyone comes out of hell and even the most staunch atheist, the staunch hater of God will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but it's too late for them, right? They'll be cast into the lake of fire. Look at what Jesus says here in uh, Mark 9. He says, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. You see, how can people ask the question, you know, how can a loving God create a place like hell? Because hell is such a terrible place that people don't want to even acknowledge its existence. They try and explain it away. They don't want it to exist in the Bible. There's a lot of Christian sects as well that try to believe that hell is not eternal. It's not as bad as the Bible describes. Or it's not real, right? It's just spiritual. It's just separation from God and the burning is just like a, a yearning to want to be with God. But it's not the case. You know, hell is a terrible place. And you know, we ask this because we trivialize God's holiness. We trivialize sin. Sin is bad. That's why hell exists. And it's giving us a picture of how we ought to think of sin. So people ask the question, how can a loving God create hell? Well, you know what? It's not the love of God that created hell. Right? It's the holiness of God that created hell. Right? It's the righteous anger of a holy God that creates hell. It's not the love that's good. You don't experience God's love in hell. It's God's hatred, his anger, his abomination at wickedness. That's what hell is. So God has a loving side too, right? And the love that he showed was through Jesus Christ. That's how you access God's love. But without Jesus Christ, you only are left with God's wrath, right? So hell is the creation of a just and holy God that hates sin. So ask yourself, when you read this, you know, is Jesus warning us about hell? You know, do you really believe hell is real? You know, do you believe people will go to hell if they are not persuaded to believe on Jesus Christ? Does it concern you at all? You know, as a believer that knows why Jesus Christ died for you and knows what would await you if you did not have Jesus Christ, does it concern you at all? Do you think, oh my gosh, that's a terrible place. I don't want people to go there. You know, what sort of Christian are what sort of Christians are we? If we know that hell exists, 
We know that there's only one way to be saved, but have absolutely no desire to tell anyone else about it. What sort of Christians are we? Right, this is another reason why we must preach the gospel. Right? We're commanded, first of all. Number two, like hell is a real place. Number three, number three is rewards. You know, this is how we earn rewards in heaven. This is what we is worth doing. You know, everybody likes a good investment. Well, you know, we, we all are good at saving for our retirement. Or save, hopefully, all we're all good at doing that. You save enough to, to put away, to take care of yourself. You know, we need to think beyond that. We need to think beyond the physical, beyond the, the vapour that is our life, and think beyond investing in our eternity. Right? And if you have this eternal perspective, you'll not be so concerned about how much riches and how much comfort you amass in this life if you have an eternal perspective and lay up treasures in heaven. Right? There is a sense of peace that comes with knowing if you are spending your time on eternal things that when life doesn't go according to plan or you have financial loss or you're not doing as well financially as you want to, that you know, you, at least you have an eternity to look forward to, right? With the rewards that you've laid up in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the foundation, if you think of our works as we build our life, try and work to earn rewards in heaven, <coughs> Jesus Christ is the starting point, right? You can't even earn rewards if you're not saved. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, so this is an analogy now of how you spend your life and your time, how are you going to build something for Jesus Christ? Are you going to build upon the foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble? What's the difference? Or every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. So God, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So we can see here the wood, hay, and stubble, when it is tried by God, will be burnt up. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now this, uh, this is not just an analogy, right, of this trying our work by fire. I know it's using the analogy of building a structure. Jesus Christ is the foundation and you build wood, hay, and stubble. But it's, not, it's actually real in the sense that, you know how, like at, at the end, when it says the elements shall melt with fervent heat, in Second Peter, and it says all these things shall be burnt up, you know, and then it lines up with the things you can see are temporary, the things that can't be seen are eternal, right? So there is actually like a physical things just burning up and disappearing, right? Because that's what's happening at the white throne judgment. They're all going to, everything's going to disappear. So the wood, hay, and stubble is representing things that you can see, the gold, silver, and precious stones. I mean, that's also going to be burnt up with all the stuff that's physical, but in this analogy, the gold, silver, and precious stones are the things that will be brought into eternity. So this is why no matter what work you burns up, you always have the foundation because you're always safe. Even though like, you know, we will be given a different body later, well, we have a, an eternal soul and a spirit that will always be alive now because we're, we're born again. And everything that you can see will be gone. So this is why sometimes we ask the question when people get saved, and we say, you know, what should your life be about? We sometimes ask the question, well, what can you bring with you into heaven? Right? Well, you can get yourself saved. What's the only other thing you can bring with you? It's other people. So this gold, silver, and precious stones that you're building, this is all about the work you do that contributes towards the Great Commission. Right? So it's not only, you know, the persuading, like you personally persuading somebody, which is like the, I guess, the, 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 that's the ultimate goal you want to get to, right? The ultimate goal is that you can sit down with somebody or talk to somebody and you convince them to believe on Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate goal, and then disciple them, right? But there are other ways to take part in the Great Commission. You know, even when you give to the church, that's a way you give to the Great Commission. You know, in other ways, you get involved in some different ministries, the way you're a part of a community. Like the, so all that work adds towards how you're going to be rewarded. And obviously, God is the ultimate measure of, <coughs> what you do, how you did it, 
Did you do it with the right mindset, the right attitude? Like all these sorts of things, you know? You, to whom much is given, much shall be required. All these things are weighed up and how God will reward you. But that gold, silver, and precious stone is people, isn't it? It's people. That's the only thing you can take with you. And that's something good to be reminded of, something good to reflect on. Can you, can you believe that? We have to, you know, but do you? Do you believe it? That's the right question. Do you believe that everything that you see in this world is, is, is all going to be gone one day? It's, an, it's a crazy thought when you think about how much time we spend living for the things of this world and how much we value it. It's good to be reminded that one day everything you see with your eyes, your physical eyes, will be gone. So what, do, what don't you see? The eternal. That's what's eternal. That's what you should be the pinnacle of your goal in life, your purpose in life, is uh, trying to you know, do things for that purpose. It's not meaning everyone needs to be full-time preaching the gospel because we need to, there's other things we need to do in our lives. But what is the purpose? 1 Corinthians uh, 9. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So this is a good reminder, this verse, to say, look how the world strives and, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into things that are not even eternal. They do that for a corruptible crown. But will we, will we put in the same effort for an incorruptible crown? That's why it requires faith. It requires believing the word of God. You know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. First Thessalonians 2, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? This is Paul saying, What is my reward in heaven? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For ye are our glory and joy. <coughs> Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Second Peter 3. So this is what I was talking about before with this uh, burning of the foundation. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the, lay, the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? in all holy conversation and godliness. This verse is reminding us that one day Jesus will return. It's interesting that it's a day of the Lord, and the Bible says the day of the Lord, days, thousand years, thousand years as a day, and then this event happens after the thousand years, so it sort of shows that the day of the Lord, maybe that whole sort of period. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. This is the verse I love, verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What sort of Christian, what sort of person should you be knowing that everything that you can see in this world will one day be gone? That's what it's asking you. That's what I'm asking you today. I'm trying to get you to reflect on. Are you living in a way that acknowledges that one day every material you, thing you own will be gone. You know, when the end comes, you know, when your life is over, what, what was the point of it? You know, you've got to think about these eternal things. What will really matter? What's the only thing from this world that you can bring to heaven with you? Right? And that's the last reason why we must go soul winning. Right? We commanded... Number two, hell exists. Number three is rewards. All right, the last verse I want to talk to you about is this one. Ma Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. 
You know, resources, money helps in a ministry. But you know what we really need? What we really need are people to do the work. Right? We need soul winners. Right? Because you can't, money can't buy a spirit-filled Christian. Do you know what I mean? Like you need to be that spirit-filled Christian that's going to go out and preach the gospel and persuade people to be saved, right? And the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. That's why we've got to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder of why we must preach the gospel. We need to preach the gospel because you command us. We need to preach the gospel because hell is a real place. Lord, help us to be loving Christians that care about the unsaved. And Lord, help us to have an eternal perspective, not to live for this life, but to live for the next life. So we thank you, Lord. Help us to be a laborer in your harvest. And we pray to you, Lord, today that you will send forth laborers into your harvest. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.